So we're very pleased to have Dr. Tangri. Um, we were just chatting before we started about the very high incidence rates of COVID in Manitoba, 15%. But instead of talking about COVID, we're going to talk about current practice patterns and benefits and harms in the management of hyperkalemia. Uh, introduction of, um, about uh, Dr. Tangri. He's an attending physician, associate professor in the Division of Nephrology um, at the Department of Medicine and the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. His research program is clinical and translational and focused on improving clinical decision making for patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. And he, as many of you know, has developed and validated the kidney failure uh, risk equation um, and uh, that predicts the need for dialysis for patients with CKD. And uh, we've worked closely uh, with him on a number of other projects. He's a participant in Council of CKD um, as a principal investigator for a, an integrative study with primary care and he's got a large prospective study on frailty, physical and cognitive function in advanced CKD. He's really a very accomplished and has published over 200 manuscripts and uh, has been awarded the CHR New Investigator Award and a foundation grant. So Nav, it's really uh, terrific to have you with us uh, and take some time from your busy schedule and uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and current analyses with respect to hyperkalemia. So thanks for making the time and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Levin. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for your attention today. I'm gonna to be talking about a slightly different topic today than my usual stuff, which is hyperkalemia. And most of this is motivated by uh, a terrific um, graduate student who I work with uh, named Sylvia Leon, who, who, you know, this was part of her master's thesis and she really, uh, you know, encouraged me to take this on and, and we, push each other uh, to find new answers and generate new evidence for hyperkalemia. So I'm gonna uh, share my slides here and hopefully uh, share with you some new data um, that we have. I hope everyone can see my slides, terrific, great. So the topic of my talk is gonna be challenges and solutions in the management of hyperkalemia. You're just and not in slide mode. Uh, if you just wanna go up to the top, put yourself into slide mode. So uh, display settings at the top there, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Now, uh, there you go. Uh, do you see it there? Uh, yes, perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm gonna go through um, you know, of some of our original research in, in what happened you know, and what happens when, uh, when hyperkalemia occurs, what, are, what does it lead to, and what are the risks and benefits. And then I'll spend the last 15 minutes going through the current treatment landscape and the new management options. I'll try to be as objective and data-driven as possible, but it's important that I state my disclosures. Uh, in particular, I, do, I have received research funding uh, from uh, AstraZeneca and Otsuka, both of which make new drugs for hyperkalemia. Uh, and here are my remaining disclosures. Hyperkalemia is prevalent and recurrent. So the reason I'm talking today is because hyperkalemia is very common in patients with chronic kidney disease. And throughout my talk, you'll see that I'll refer to hyperkalemia as a potassium level of greater than 5.5. Um, you know, in this slide, in this particular study, it was, uh, uh, you know, they, there was a, there was an issue of uh, defining it as five and looking at risk factors for that, but virtually through the entire presentation, we're really going to be considering what nephrologists consider to be hyperkalemia, which I think is most greater than 5.5. And as you know, it's, although the incidence in the general population is two to 3%, up to about 30% uh, of patients with CKD will have an initial episode of hyperkalemia during a one to two year follow-up, and more than 40% then continue to have uh, the recurrent episodes. Uh, this is further compounded in patients who are RAS users and those who, are, those who have congestive heart failure, both of, both of which are very common in our patient population. Effectively, in my view, that if, if you have a patient with CKD in your practice who's on a RAS inhibitor, and 70% of our patients are, that about a third will have an episode of hyperkalemia. And once they have one, there's almost an 80 to 90% chance that they'll have another one in the follow-up period. In this large study looking at the, looking at the VA, um, you know, the incidence of hyperkalemia of greater than 5.5 was only 9% in patients without CKD, but increased to 20, 40, and 57% uh, as patients approached dialysis. Uh, in this other study, a smaller cohort, it was about 30%, but really a 40 to 50% uh, is an expected number in CKD four and five once patients are on a RAS inhibitor. 
in heart failure, uh, in particularly when patients get on MRAs, in addition to RAS inhibitors, the prevalence of hyperkalemia really increases. Um, so in the clinical trials like Riles, Emphasis, and Ephesus, um, they excluded and carefully monitored patients who had a potassium levels of greater than five. And more re most recently in the Bayer trial for phenarinone, Fidelio, uh, patients with a potassium of greater than 4.8 were excluded. And even in these trials, there was a higher incidence of hyperkalemia with the, with the MRAs. And what I'm gonna show you is that this is much higher in clinical practice with MRAs than it was seen in the clinical trials. So this is in Ephesus. So in Ephesus, you know, um, the hyperkalemia rate was up to about 30% in patients uh, with a GFR less than 30 when they were on epilronone and 23% when they were on placebo. And, you know, most nephrologists are not seeing anybody outside of heavily proteinuric or glomerular disease in patients with a GFR less than 50. But here in this group, again, about a third of patients, even in a clinical trial setting, had uh, hyperkalemia greater than 5.5. In real life, this manifests to even higher rates of hospitalization and severe hyperkalemia. So this is a, a landmark study done by David Gerlink in New England Journal in 2004. This showed hyperkalemia rates after the publication of RAILS in patients in Ontario. Uh, so this is uh, basically what this shows is there was an uptick in the prescription of spironolactone post RALS in Ontario. And this led to not only hyperkalemia recognized in the lab, but hyperkalemia related hospitalizations. And that would be very serious episodes of hyperkalemia. In these multiple cohort studies, you know, the point that we're trying to make here is that hyperkalemia even greater than six tends to occur in, in patients who are on MRAs. So you see in the clinical trials of MRAs, greater than six only occurs in two to two and a half percent of people, but in community-based studies, this rate can go from six to 12%. So really quite dangerous hyperkalemia, which is hyperkalemia requiring an ER visit or a hospitalization can occur in up to 10% of patients who are on mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. And this is important, again, with phenarinone probably coming to the Canadian market in about a year. The predictors of hyperkalemia before starting a RAS are very simple, EGFR less than 45, and a potassium greater than 4.5 in the absence of RAS inhibitors. So if a patient is not on a RAS inhibitor today or an MRA and their potassium is already 4.5, it's highly likely that they'll develop hyperkalemia after starting one of these medications. And why does it matter? Well, other than the obvious sort of sudden cardiac death, there is a, you know, hyperkalemia has a clear U-shaped curve when associated with all-cause mortality. So this is, you know, adjusted um, in, in patients with diabetes, heart failure and CKD, and heart failure CKD and diabetes. And you see the probability of death is markedly higher in, in these high-risk groups once you have hyperkalemia, pretty much starts taking off at about 4.5, which is the nadir, and just continues on from there. Even in patients on dialysis, both incident and prevalent, you see a, a curve shifting up here. The shift is right at about 5.5. Um, and, and you clearly see that the numbers start to go up uh, when you're unadjusted, case mix adjusted, and so on. This is a large, uh, large dialysis study done by Chapa Covesti and Cam Kalanter and all. And again, in, so in non-dialysis CKD, the nadir is at 4.5 for mortality. And in dialysis patients, it's about at 5.5. So I think I don't need to convince uh, this nephrology audience that hyperkalemia has serious clinical and economic consequences, typically ventricular arrhythmias, ED visits, hospitalizations, muscle weakness, sudden death. But it is important to know that when a patient is admitted in the US, um, they have an average length of stay of 3.3 days and they cost about $35,000. I would say in Canada, you're probably looking at about 10 to 12K per admission for hyperkalemia with a mean length of stay, again, ranging from two to four days. So whether you're in US or Canada, hyperkalemia is common in patients with CKD on RAS inhibitors, and it does lead to adverse consequences for the patient and for the health system. So with all of that in the background, I'd like to uh, switch to our primary research question. We wanted to know that knowing all of this, if you have a patient uh, with CKD 
who has uh, an on a RAS inhibitor, so angiotensin receptor blocker or ARB, uh, sorry, or ACE inhibitor, and they have an episode of hyperkalemia, what should you do? And that question really hasn't been well answered, and that's what we sought to answer. So our research question was, is the discontinuation of RAS inhibitors after an episode of hyperkalemia associated with adverse outcomes in patients with CKD compared to continuation? And our next follow-up questions was, what is the risk in patients who get a suboptimal dose or a lower dose versus those who continue at maximal dose compared to discontinuation? So what we wanted to see was a bit of a dose response. We wanted to see the highest risk. Our hypothesis was that they would be the highest risk with discontinuation, intermediate with lower dose, and the lowest risk with those who continue at the maximal dose. And to answer this question, we queried retrospect, we did a retrospective cohort study querying the administrative health data from Manitoba. So to give you some background, uh, Manitoba has a very rich population health data repository. All uh, of the provincial admin data goes as far back as the you know, 70s or 80s. All prescription data is captured since 1994 for all adults, not just those over 65. And 75% of the lab data has been entered since 2006. So since 2006, we would have access to lab data for the majority of the province, and we could link that with uh, admin data, claims, and medications. Our objective in this study was to look at adults who were 18 years old, who had an episode of de novo hyperkalemia, who were, had CKD defined by an EGFR less than 60 at baseline, so only CKD three through five, and who were current ACE inhibitors or ARB users at the time of the hyperkalemia episode. As I mentioned, uh, Manitoba uh, started having collected lab data at the end of 2006, so we started our clock at 2007 and we chose 10 years of data. And we, uh, we defined hyperkalemia as a potassium level greater than 5.5. We assessed based on covariates in the one year prior to the hyperkalemia episode. We looked at age, sex, EGFR, whether this was an incident episode or a recurrence episode. We looked at comorbid conditions and medications. And we obtained all these potential confounders through linkages with hospitalizations, physician claims, and medications using validated algorithms whenever possible. So the start of the study time was 2006, patients had their initial hyperkalemia episode. And then we wanted to give everybody a chance to either continue or discontinue uh, their drug. Uh, so we gave, made everybody immortal for 90 days in a way to get rid of immortal time bias. So both patients who discontinued or continued were, had to be alive at 90 days. What we didn't want was the mortality from the initial episode itself to be reflected. Um, so if you were alive at 90 days, then we started ascertaining your exposure. So did you, did you get a RAS inhibitor again or did you permanently stop it? And then even then we modeled the exposure primarily as a time dependent. So let's say a patient is at day 90 now after their initial hyperkalemia episode and they start their RAS inhibitor again. What happens is that they're on it now for a year and then they stop it. So what we would do is we would count that first year as time on drug and we would count the remaining years as discontinuation time or time off drug. Similarly, if somebody was off drug at day 90 but started uh, their RAS inhibitor again one year later, they would have the first year as time off drug and then they would consequently have time on drug thereafter. In both of these cases, uh, we looked at both a time-dependent approach, which I believe is more accurate, as well as a um, intention-to-treat approach where we just took people, what their status was at day 90, continuation or discontinuation, and we followed everybody till the end of study time. So this way, we had uh, you know, the best chance uh, to reduce immortal time bias and other key biases that can affect observational studies of drugs. Discontinuation was defined as no refill after the last day of supply plus a 90-day grace period. So this is very typical for pharmacoepidemiology. We, we, you know, we say that the longest uh, a drug prescription can be in 90 days. So, so when you have your last prescription, we add 90 days to that, and that's defined as your discontinuation. And then you can start 
your discontinuation time. The primary outcome in this analysis was all-cause mortality, followed by cardiovascular mortality, need for dialysis, fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular event, and, and cataract surgery as a negative control outcome. What we wanted to see was possible benefit for the first four outcomes and no effect for cataract surgery, which is simply a marker of healthcare utilization. Um, what, the reason for doing this is to, is to make sure that what we're not capturing, that continuation is not a, just a marker for seeing your doctor. Patients who are more likely to see their doctor are, are, um, are, there, are, you know, are more likely to get cataract surgery. So if receiving a repeat prescription for RAS inhibitor is, uh, is just a marker for seeing your physician and discontinuation is a marker for somebody who never follows up, then we should have probably seen an effect in cataract surgery. So let me give you a bit of a breakdown. So we had 34,317 hyperkalemia events, 16,000 of those patients uh, had CKD, and 8,500 were on RAS inhibitors at the time they had their hyperkalemia event. This event was associated with a high degree of mortality and, and after surviving patients after the 90 days who also uh, had not left or had not been lost to follow up were 7,203. These patients were on average 74 years old and had an average serum potassium of 5.8, a GFR of 40, and 63% of them had diabetes, 37% had heart failure, and 30% had atrial fibrillation. Um, we would say that these patients were highly representative of patients seen in nephrology practice, as I'm sure that uh, you would agree in, in your British Columbia-based practices. Over the follow-up period of about three years, so 21,857 person years of follow-up, 45% um, of the patients died. So the mortality rate was very high at about 15% per year in these older adults with CKD and hyperkalemia. So the punchline, all discontinuation was associated with a 2.68 hazard ratio or a massively large increase of all-cause death. Um, in, in adjusted models for age, sex, EGFR, your baseline potassium, hyperkalemia recurrence, comorbid conditions, and relevant medications. So in these patients who were 90, alive for 90 days after their initial hyperkalemia episode, if they never started their RAS inhibitor again, they had a much higher risk of all-cause death. When we looked at cardiovascular death, this was the major driver. So they had of a substantially higher increase of cardiovascular death as well. So non-cardiovascular death was not really very different. This was predominantly driven by cardiovascular mortality. Fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events were 76% higher. So combination outcome, of including MI, stroke, sort of MACE type outcomes, very high. Dialysis was not much higher. So it was 1.06. Uh, with uh, only 143 events. Um, so two reasons for this. One, all-cause mortality was very high, very high rate of death. So 45% of people died in three years. So very high competing events. So 3,200 competing events versus 143 events really skewing this. And what we find, uh, I, I, you know, we don't have final vetted data yet, but in a larger validation data set in Ontario, we do see a signal for dialysis as well. So to summarize these first four pieces, when we look at continuation or discontinuation of RAS inhibitors as an exposure, we see a higher risk of death for fatal and non-fatal MI, cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality with discontinuation of hyperkalemia, uh, with discontinuation of RAS inhibitors. What do we see uh, with cataract surgery? Well, actually we see nothing. And that's, that's really reassuring. So there's no benefit or harm, it's completely null, as null as it can be, 0.95, um, with cataract surgery uh, and, the, and the question of you know, continuation or discontinuation of RAS inhibitor use. So it does not appear that RAS inhibitor use is a surrogate simply for healthcare utilization. So that was the time-dependent analysis, which we felt was, should be the primary analysis and is more accurate. 
Nonetheless, we wanted to mimic a randomized trial and did look at an intention to treat approach. So in this intention to treat approach, your first treatment after the 90 day survival period, whether you discontinued or continued is considered your assignment. So it means that you were either assigned to discontinuation or assigned to continuation. Uh, discontinuation here was again, very consistent results. So 2.14 for all cause mortality, 2.04 for cardiovascular and 1.33 for fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. So the intention to treat analysis, again, negative for cataracts, completely shows a consistent finding with the time-dependent analysis that discontinuation of RAS inhibitor after an episode is associated with harm. What about dose reduction? So of those patients who were on uh, initially, uh, who were on RAS inhibitors, 35% were on maximal dose and 65% were on a submaximal dose. We call it suboptimal, but really the term is submaximal. And after 90 days, only 23% remained on the maximal dose, 53% were now on the submaximal dose, um, and 23% had discontinued. Breaking this down further, in those who were already on the maximum dose at baseline, we found that about half stayed on the maximal dose, a quarter discontinued the drug altogether, and a quarter of the time uh, the, the dose was reduced. So what we're finding, uh, to summarize these last three slides, is that if you take 100 patients who are on RAS inhibitors at baseline, about a quarter of the time the drugs are stopped after an episode of hyperkalemia, and probably about another quarter of the time uh, the dose is reduced, and only about half the time does the maximal dose continue. Now, what does submaximal dose mean? So here we see a, a graded response for all cause mortality. Submaximal dose has a 20% higher risk. Uh, discontinuation is much worse than submaximal dose, and discontinuation versus maximal dose is higher. We do see a bit of dilution for cardiovascular mortality. So suboptimal doses were not associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular mortality or fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. So, so to summarize, you know, we sort of see a, a somewhat of a dose response. There's certainly benefit with dose reduction compared to discontinuation, uh, but there does appear to be some residual signal for harm. Whether that's residual confounding or not is difficult to say based on this analysis. Uh, but we, you know, again, we don't see any effect of submaximal dosing and the negative control outcome being cataracts. So to summarize, we find widespread suboptimal usage of RAS inhibitors in our study population. Um, we find the lowest risk of death with maximal dose, and we find that suboptimal doses are associated with a lower risk of death compared to discontinuation. So all of these findings, before I sort of jump into the next section of this talk, really suggest that there's something about uh, an episode of hyperkalemia that's a critical decision point in patients who are on a RAS inhibitor and CKD. Uh, and that we certainly see harm with patients who stop their RAS inhibitor altogether. Now, what are, you know, what are some of the things that could potentially explain this? So one is that, you know, this patient could have a recurrence of hyperkalemia and maybe that's why doctors stop. So we were very careful to adjust for recurrence and it doesn't matter uh, whether, whether this was your second or third episode, stopping was still associated with harm. The second question could be, what if the first potassium was six uh, and the, you know, versus 5.6 and patients and doctors were more likely to stop if it was higher? Well, we actually don't see any effect of the uh, initial hyperkalemia on this downstream risk of death. So, so I don't think that that was a, a problem either. And that doesn't explain uh, the, uh, the association with discontinuation. The only thing we don't have, and I want to highlight an important variable, is we don't know what the blood pressure was at 90 days. So, so I can't tell you uh, whether the patients who discontinued, you know, had a lower blood pressure, uh, and that's why, you know, and that's why they discontinued, which could then be associated with a higher risk of death. So that's, you know, one important limitation here. And I think the other part is that, you know, this is observational data, and this describes an association a consistent association that we don't see with cataracts, that we see 
validated in another data set, which, which I don't have data today to show you, but I have, we have run the analysis and we find it very consistent in another data set. Um, but it points to a potential opportunity uh, where we could improve practice. Now, how would we change this practice and what are the current treatment options? So this is just a reminder slide that nephrologists generally don't need. But as a reminder, you know, we stabilize the membrane, then we use insulin, and then we're really left with how do we remove potassium from the body? Okay. And, you know, the, in non dialysis kidney disease, most of the time we're really talking about SPS or loop diuretics. And before we get into any of the new binders, I think it's important for us to see what is the current usage pattern of SPS and loop diuretics in the management of acute hyperkalemia and chronic hyperkalemia. So in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I wanted to go through the perception versus reality of how we manage hyperkalemia currently, uh, go through SPS or loop diuretics and show some advantages or disadvantages of current treatment options. Um, I would ask you at this point to do an internal poll where you ask yourself, what proportion of the time do patients get a prescription for SPS after an episode of hyperkalemia, because I'm about to share some data uh, as to what it might be. I would argue that when we do polls of nephrologists, they estimate that 20 to 25 percent of the time patients get SPS and 20 to 25 percent of the time patients get a loop diuretic. Remind you, we're talking about hyperkalemia greater than 5.5, not 5. So let's go through SPS. So SPS is sodium polystyrene. Uh, it removes 0.5 to 1 milligram of potassium in exchange for 2 to 3 milligrams of sodium. Each gram contains 100 milligrams of sodium. So your 30 gram dose that we give for an episode of hyperkalemia contains about 3 grams of sodium. Uh, patients with CKD or heart failure uh, have, uh, you know, not supposed to consume more than 2 grams a day. So just keep that in mind. Um, it, and therefore, administration of SPS chronically is associated with worsening edema, weight gain, and blood pressure control. Uh, and, and there is some caution about patients with severe heart failure simply because of this large sodium load. Easy to remember, 30 grams is 3 grams of sodium. Now, what about the rare adverse events? So this is a really nice analysis done by my colleague, Dr. Manish Sood in ICES, uh, Ontario data looking at the 30-day probability of severe GI injury requiring hospitalization or ED visit with KXLate compared to non-use. So really, really important here is to look at the y-axis and look at the probability of event. So non-use uh, is in orange, use is in blue. This is time from the KXLate prescription. And you see the, the numbers here are 0.998 for KXLate and 0.990 uh, for non-use. So we're really talking about sort of a 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 10,000 event, but a serious event. Event requiring a colonic necrosis, colonic obstruction, you know, that type of event requiring hospitalization. So why do I put this up? I put this up to, 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 to remind us, one, that these events do happen and that there is a true risk with kx -Late. Two, that the risk is small uh, for an individual patient, but real on a population scale. And three, because the event is so uncommon, one in 1,000 to one in 10,000, it is extremely likely that all of us in the audience, myself included, would have never seen it and may not believe it for that reason. Rare events like this are, uh, you know, clinicians, uh, we don't think that this exists because we've never seen it, uh, but they do happen when you look in a large population. So, so I think that those are some of the, the key takeaways from this slide. So to put that into context, now let's go back to the question about what happens currently in Canada, uh, or at least in Manitoba, when patients have an episode of hyperkalemia. So recall that I asked, how often do you think kx is used? And you know, I would say that most people guess 20 to 25, but the actual answer is 4%. Only 4% of the time after an episode of hyperkalemia in the province of Manitoba greater than 5.5 is there a prescription for kx or SPS or CPS. And the vast majority of the time, um, you know, it's done for less than 10 days and there is no chronic use of SPS. 
most patients may receive one or two other prescriptions, but SPS is largely a acute treatment in Canada for hyperkalemia that is often prescribed within a week, lowers potassium by 0.7 to 0.8, and uh, is usually not prescribed in the long term or not taken in the long term. What about loop diuretics? So in patients, uh, you know, we found that 43% of patients with hyperkalemia were on a loop diuretic, but a new loop diuretic prescription only happened about 10% of the time. So 5% of the time, five out of 100 patients with hyperkalemia get SPS, 10 get a loop diuretic, so that's 15, and about 25 to 35% of the time, RAS inhibitors are either stopped or reduced, and about half the time, nothing gets done. So, uh, so just, you know, I, th I think all of that puts into context um, that therapies to treat hyperkalemia are underutilized or not used, and that probably there is an unmet need. So in the last 10 minutes of my talk, I'd like to go through uh, new treatment options and just give you an overview of the benefits and drawbacks of them. So here are the two new binders, PSC or Pterimer or Veltasa, or SZZ, uh, sodium zirconium, or Localma. So let's go through pteromer first. So pteromer is a polymer, okay? It's a complex, heavy polymer uh, that exchanges potassium, uh, calcium for potassium. It works in the colon and starts working in about four to seven hours. Uh, it can lead to hypomagnesemia as a rare side effect about 5% of the time. Not really serious hypomagnesemia at all but it can lead to mild to moderate GI effects, namely constipation in, with, uh, with higher doses. The recommended dose is 8.4 grams a day and can be titrated to maximum 25. Most patients should not need this dose and for any chronic use, it's 8.4. The other new binder is zirconium, which is an inorganic cation exchanger that traps potassium and exchanges it for sodium. This one is very high affinity and it works in the entire GI tract and starts working in an hour. Um, it also has mild to moderate GI effects, but it can lead to edema and we'll go through that. And here the dose is 10 grams for the TID for the first two days and five to 10 grams once daily. So I've gone over some of the KXLate data. I'll try to show you how these two binders uh, distinguish themselves from the current treatment options. So pteromer is, uh, is, you know, is a high capacity binder. It's these spherical balls that are too large for it to be absorbed. So it's absolutely completely non-absorbed and completely excreted in the stool. So you don't need to worry about your patients depositing pteromer in their liver and their bone or anything like that. And calcium is the counter exchange item. <coughs> Relipsa, the company which, uh, which uh, discovered pteromer, decided to name all its trials after jewels. So opal, pearl, amethyst, and amber were the large trials. About a couple hundred patients in each trials. Follow-up initially was four weeks, and then ranged to 52 weeks. And they looked at several important populations, such as CKD receiving RAS therapy, that's opal, which I'll highlight for you today. Heart failure, receiving RAS inhibitor, and resistant hypertension. In OPAL, uh, the median potassium change from baseline was 0 0.72 between placebo and drug. Uh, that's, you know, just an OPAL in four weeks. But to give you a more accurate representation, I'll stop for a second here. In this one-year study over time, this is an amethyst, patients who started between 5.3 and 5.8 were able to maintain a potassium of 4.5, and when they stopped the drug, their potassium went up. To summarize all of the pteromer data into, <clears throat> into a brief talk, what I would say is that pteromer uh, safely and effectively lowers potassium uh, by about one mill equivalent chronically, uh, at least out to one year. And, and given that it's been approved in the U.S. for at least five years, there's a fair bit of safety data that suggests that, uh, that it can be used chronically uh, without any rare adverse effects popping up. So about one mill equivalent decrease works in about four to seven hours, but chronically 
fair to seems appears fairly safe and uh, no real issues with hypomagnesemia in clinical practice. Let's go through zirconium. So zirconium is an inorganic crystalline zirconium. It's not a polymer. Uh, it's insoluble, highly stable. Both of these binders are much better tolerated than cancellate. Again, not systemically absorbed, but it exchanges sodium for, uh, for potassium and it's 800 milligrams of, uh, of sodium for a 10, 10 gram dose. Here the trials were named ZS, ZS, and Harmonize, and again, very similar. So 700 patients, 250 patients, all hyperkalemia, a lot of trials in patients with CKD and RAS inhibitor, and I'm gonna pick a representative study to show you the effects. So Harmonize was a phase three multicenter, two phase prospective study with an open label randomized withdrawal phase. These were patients on RAS inhibitor, and they compared potassium levels between placebo and zirconium, and there was an open label phase and a randomized phase. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you what happened to the potassium uh, during this trial, particularly focusing on the first two days. So what's remarkable about zirconium is that it works very quickly, unlike KXLate. Um, here, a patient, as a, this is the average patient in this study, starts at about 5.5, 5.6, and by four hours, they're already at five. By one, by one hour, it's already dropped by 0.2, and in 2.2 hours, they're at normal level, and at 48 hours, they're at four and a half. So the key I would say with zirconium is that it can lower your potassium from the high fives, even the sixes, down to a normal range. It starts working very quickly, and it, by 48 hours, you can, in a way, almost set it and forget it. So it, it, in a way, it's an uh, ideal drug for acute use, and um, and kind of getting your patients to avoid that emergency room visit, avoid uh, you know, them coming into urgent care, and potentially avoid hospitalization if they're observed uh, for a short period of time and you see, it. if they've already presented, you can potentially avoid a hospitalization. In terms of side effect profile, the one thing to highlight is that with chronic use of zirconium, about 11 to 14%, eight to 11 percent of patients do develop edema. And, and this is again because of the sodium load of about a gram a day with daily chronic use. So I think that has to be kept in mind for patients who are salt sensitive and the patients who may uh, have edema at baseline and those with congestive heart failure. So to summarize uh, the, these two drugs, Pteribur uses calcium and probably you know, doesn't start working until about four to seven hours. Uh, zirconium exchanges sodium and starts working very quickly, starts working within an hour, but it does lead to uh, a edema because of its so use of sodium in about 10% of individuals. Pteromer doesn't have edema, uh, can lead to constipation, but really both drugs can lead to mild uh, GI effects. Both these drugs can be considered uh, for patients who are prone to recurrence or those with non-emergent hyperkalemia. Both of them have some uh, drug drug interactions, so they need to be separated out from uh, from other drugs that the patient patient is taking. Um, but in a way, I think both of them have unique advantages over KXLate. Uh, zirconium has less salt, uh, somewhat than KXLate, and works very quickly and is much more potent. Pteromir has no salt, uh, and and and. And, you know, has been shown in chronic use to be fairly safe at least to about a year out. There is a large trial underway with Pteromer um, uh, to look at whether it can enable RAS inhibitor use and what the benefit is. So specifically answer the question that our research raised, but that trial won't read out for another two to three years. And I think even in the absence of that data, um, for patients where hyperkalemia needs to be managed, uh, both of these drugs present uh, options that have advantages to KXLate. And in a way, I would argue that, that, that KXLate shouldn't really be uh, discussed in detail because it's only used 5% of the time. So, so I think if you, if you take all of this information away, what we presented was that continuation of RAS inhibitor use is associated with improved survival in patients with CKD, that currently, you know, there's binders are not really used to treat hyperkalemia in these patients and discontinuation is the dominant treatment strategy. And therefore, I would argue there's an unmet need for new treatments for hyperkalemia in patients with CKD.
So with all of that, I, I really look forward to questions. And again, I want to acknowledge Sylvia, who is my graduate student extraordinaire, who completely led this project and drove all this work. These are some of our uh, photos from our lab. Um, and uh, thank you, and I look forward to questions. Thanks, Nav. That was great and, uh, and great work, certainly looking at the way that we currently treat. And I think it's always good to reflect on what it is that you think you do and what it is that you actually do. And I think that many of us uh, thought that, that uh, hypercalemia uh, with chronic treatment was much more than, uh, than is evidenced by the fact uh, when you look at the data. Um, I guess on a broad level, um, and I don't know what it's like in Manitoba, but there's huge variability even in the way, thing, the way hyperkidemia is treated in the hospital, let alone chronically. And I think that those two things are also conflated, right? So acute hyperkidemia in a hospitalized patient and then chronic hyperkidemia and, and how, how are you suggesting that we define or manage that or what would be your recommendations? So, so I think that's a really interesting point. We didn't have access to any in-hospital formulary medications or what was prescribed in hospital or in hospital labs. So our data, you know, really even shows management in the community. I think, um, you know, my, this is all opinion, but my opinion is that, uh, you know, one of the new binders, for example, zirconium really has some advantages for the in-hospital setting because I think that, because it starts to work in an hour and it's more potent um, that, you know, if I was to make a decision between, and we've had to make these decisions where a patient's potassium is six and they may stay an extra day in hospital as a result. With a drug like that, you can give it and, and you know, safely have the patient follow up as an outpatient. Um, so, so I think there are some distinct advantages for in hospital and acute use. Great. So there are three questions from people. I'm going to ask them. Um, so was there a subgroup analysis for those with lower GFRs, either the less than 30 or less than 15 in your um, yeah. cohort analysis? Yeah. So I, I think we found consistent results in those with the EGFR less than 30. We did not do one with EGFR less than 15. Uh, not sure if we had enough patients, but we do in our validation data set. So it's an excellent suggestion. Um, our validation data set is in from ICES in Ontario. So, right. so it's about tenfold the number of patients. So, so, so we will be doing, we can look at that in, uh, in that data set. Great. And then um, what's the sodium load comparison of the SCZ compound compared with um, SPS? Okay. Yeah, so really good question. And I had to look this up, uh, you know, in detail in anticipation for this talk. So, so uh, S, uh, KXLate is one gram per 10 grams, but you might need a 30 gram dose. So three grams of sodium to get the same effect as 10, 800 milligrams of SZZ, which is a 10, 10 gram dose of SZZ. So I think uh, a 10, 10 dose of SZZ is equivalent probably in efficacy to a 30 gram dose of KXLate. And you're looking at 800 milligrams versus three grams of sodium, if you look at just sodium to sodium load. Okay. And then um, there was, in a couple of your slides, there was the mention of hypokalemia. And yeah. so is that from oversensitive use or perhaps erroneous hyperkalemia, which we certainly have seen here? Um, yeah. So what would be the causes of I think some of these drugs are potent enough, and if people make the right dietary changes, you could get a little bit of a, an, an, an overshoot. But, you know, generally, as you know, uh, in our practice, we don't see that often, right? Like, I mean, there's very few patients. Because use in current practice is so judicious anyway, that we're really only reserving chronic binder use, I think, Canadian nephrologists, for patients who have multiple recurrent episodes. So I think right. uh, those patients are less likely to be prone to hypokalemia. Right, and then the calcium, uh, we also use a lot of calcium rhizonium yeah. here, uh, as opposed to SPS, which is more expensive, but doesn't give you the sodium load and technically more uh, efficacious because it's a two to one bind, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a really good question. I, we just have virtually no rhizonium use in Manitoba. So I really can't comment on, uh, on that, so uh, all the use, only binder used here is predominantly yeah, SPS. So, so okay. difficult for me to comment, but good question. Yeah. And then um, in addition to hyperkalemia, were the patients having reduced kidney function? Uh, 
And was that factored into your analysis? Yeah, so we, we looked at dialysis as an endpoint rather than just a straight decline in kidney function as an endpoint. Um, and we didn't see a change in Manitoba, but I think we did see one in Ontario with the larger numbers with maintenance of RAS inhibitor therapy. So, so it turns out that there is a lot of protection, whether that's association or, or causal, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, one of the questions is with the new SGLT2 inhibitors, um, and whilst initially there was uh, some question about hyperkalemia in any of the trials that has not borne out, um, and, and that's with maximal ACE and ARB use, so do you think it's worthwhile doing a relook of, of Credence and EMPA and DAPA and having a look at what the true incidence of hyperkalemia in that group is? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, we haven't seen any of that in our data as well, like in population data on SGLT2 inhibitor, there just doesn't seem to be any hyperkalemia. But uh, as you're well aware, um, you know, if phenerenone becomes broadly used, we'll see it. Right. You know, because in the phenerenone trials, uh, patients were very carefully monitored, not allowed to enter if their potassium was 4.8 or higher. And they saw about 3 to 3% 3 hyperkalemia requiring drug discontinuation. So I suspect in clinical practice, about 10% of patients will develop hyperkalemia requiring discontinuation with phenerenone. Right. That's, yeah, most people are saying that. But again, it's not freely available. So uh, question about dietary restrictions. Um, and yeah, so whether or not they actually impact serum potassium. So that's a really interesting question. I actually just saw an article in NDT uh, yesterday, which looked at a food frequency questionnaire um, and found that potassium in the diet based on a food frequency questionnaire was not associated with hyperkalemia. Um, I, uh, so two things. So one, I think food frequency questionnaires are really limited and have people have generally don't have good recall. So uh, that's a big limitation, I think, of those studies. Um, the second thing is that one, um, one thing that's in favor of diet not impacting it much is all of the studies done by Don Wesson and colleagues on fruits and vegetables to treat metabolic acidosis and CKD never showed any hyperkalemia increase. They never showed it. And these were patients who were prone because of their acidosis. Right. So uh, I think that uh, we need... A, a, a more randomized study to actually look at dietary restriction. And, uh, and you know, it, like obviously if you had unlimited resources, uh, the best study would be to provide all the food to participants so you could actually monitor what the potassium you're giving in the two groups and see whether it, maintain, it has an impact. But uh, otherwise you'd have to rely on, um, you know, patients following advice in the two randomized groups on dietary restriction. But I think the best study would be randomize people, give them food boxes with different potassium contents, check their levels, and then after transition them to a lower high potassium diet. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's really worthwhile pursuing might because- not, Might not be so undoable. There's another question about the low binder use generalizable to other similar populations. If that's directed at like, is that true in other groups, I can tell you, Dr. Kareem, that when we looked at this at the beginning of the COVID thing to try and see who needed more potassium binder at home from the KCC group because of they were on it, the number of people who were actually on, as, as Nav pointed out, on chronic um, hyperkalemia treatment is very low. And I think it was less than 10% in the kidney care clinics. So very consistent with your data. And I think that is something again, which I think would warrant a, a prospective cohort study maybe to look and see like what, because we all think that we see it a lot and yet it doesn't, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, and uh, on ICES data showed exactly the same thing, that chronic use of binder is very low, very, very low. Yeah, so there's a repeat offenders that drive us crazy, but <laughs> most of them are one-offs and they don't all end up on chronic therapy. Um, I'm just going to check uh, some more questions in case somebody put one in the chat box as well. Dr. Word, did you want to ask a question? You just have to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, Dr. Word, can you unmute and then we can 
get Oral's type of your question in. Oh, I think that's some technical difficulties. Any, can you unmute Dr. Werb um, Sedoni? No, I, I can't actually. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Ron, maybe if you want to put it in the chat box or the Q&A box, we can ask it. So we also have found in this province, I'm not sure if it's the same in, Albert, in um, Manitoba, um, whether that depending on which lab you get things done in, you will have more or less hyperkalemia. So the outpatient life labs, for a number of technical reasons, not even hemolysis, but rather just even whole blood versus um, other, will find more higher potassium levels. So if you have, is this true? Have you looked at that difference, like outpatient labs versus hospital labs or anything like that? No, actually, that's a good point. Uh, I think we actually, it would, we can do this because we have the labs, you know, where, where it came from. And some of the labs are actually rural and remote labs. So right. the blood may be sitting there for longer. So I wonder if it's, yeah, that's a, it's a really good point because the longer it sits, the more. <laughs> yeah, and even even just what we discovered is the platforms are different and there's an ex, there, there's a known variability yeah. of, yeah. Um, of serum versus uh, plasma potassium and there's a known yeah. variation that uh, yeah. Life Labs tells us is expected of about 0.3 um, yeah. difference, which it would be also interesting to look at. Um, but, yeah, also, as you know, you know, what, whatever your lab classifies as normal or red or star has an impact on, on practice, on, on prescribing and practicing. And um, so that's, you know, worth thinking about as well in absolutely. real life. Yeah. Um, so a question about uh, the taste or the uh, patient acceptance of SCZ, FSZC versus yes. yeah. Yeah, so I think both, uh, so pterimer I know is completely tasteless. It's like a tasteless powder. And I think does SCZ also is much, much tasteless. And from, from taste perspective, both of them are better than, uh, better than SPS. So. Great. And um, I guess it goes without saying, but really worthwhile for this audience to appreciate. None of these are cures for hyperkalemia, yes. right? They are all treatments. And I guess... That's the other question is in the studies, uh, people were left on the potassium binder for an extended period of time. But if we're not using it that way currently with SPS, are we suggesting that people who respond to the drug stay on it indefinitely? Or are we still using it as an intermittent therapy? Because I think that the studies weren't designed as intermittent therapy, correct? Yeah, a lot of the one-year studies were meant so that people, you know, a lot these drugs, all the long-term studies are designed to think of these drugs as enabling drugs, that if you use this drug chronically, you can then stay on your MRA, your Entresto, your RAS inhibitor, and so on. Um, there isn't, uh, because they're, they were focused to look at hyperkalemia, you can't really make any signals about, you know, did those patients benefit from staying on therapy? Uh, kind of, you have to take one extra leap of logic to think that, you know, we know, you know, drug X works, and if you're allowed to stay on, maybe that, only the diamond study, which is ongoing, will definitively answer that question. Yeah, but, as, uh, I, but I, yeah. Yeah. as I'm thinking about it, it's like right now we use SPS or calcium resonia intermittently. Yeah. If we had access to these new drugs, would we use them intermittently, or would we use them consistently? consistently as they did in the studies because that's not current practice and we'd have to test that, right? Yeah. Uh, right at, yeah. yeah. In the US, um, you know, one a real world analysis where I've seen where patients who were, you know, kind of just observationally, patients who were on chronic SPS versus chronic pterimer, for example, um, the, uh, or, you know, I'm sure the same would be true for SSD. The, the, to the tolerance to take the drug chronically was higher. Right. So, you know, so the, the appetite stuff, the side effects from SPS really are true. And so even patients who are prescribed chronic therapy, the patient is more likely to stay on if you, with the newer binders. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Well, it looks like we've answered everyone's questions. I'm just doing a last double check. But um, 
Thank you very much, both for the, the analysis and the thoughtfulness and the, you know, making us all reflect on what we do, but also in giving us some real, no pun intended, food for thought in terms of the way that we think about this. Um, so thanks for making the time and thanks all of you. We had uh, at your, our highest peak, we had over 52 people on the line. So that's pretty fantastic for a Friday morning. Yeah, thank um, you everyone. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Nab, and thanks to all of you. Bye. -bye.